As we begin our second lesson this morning, I want you to turn with me and look in Colossians 1.13. Colossians 1.13. We're going to talk about the importance of God's kingdom and how a person enters into that kingdom. Now, why is this important? This is important, number one, because we need to make sure that we are in that kingdom. You cannot go to heaven unless you are a part of God's kingdom. So obviously that's important for us to recognize are we in this kingdom or not. And number two, this lesson is also important because we need to be able to help other people know how they can get into the kingdom as well. Now Colossians 1.13, this is one of the verses in the Bible that talks about the kingdom. And really what this verse is going to tell you is that there's not just one kingdom, but there's actually two kingdoms. There is the kingdom of this world, and then there is the kingdom of God. And every human being is going to be in one of those two kingdoms. It's kind of like what I said earlier this morning. Either you were walking in the flesh, or you were walking in the spirit. Either you were serving God, or you were in the world. And this is a verse that makes that very clear to us. But notice what it says here, Colossians chapter 1 beginning in verse number 13, as Paul writes his letter to the Colossians, one of the things he tells them here, verse 13, speaking about God, he says, "...who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son." Look at the word translated. That means to bring something over. God has brought us over from the darkness of this world, the power of darkness, the kingdom of darkness. He has translated us, brought us over from that, and placed us into the kingdom of His dear Son. That's the privilege that you have as a Christian. But how did that happen? At what point were you brought into God's kingdom? And at what point are other people going to be brought into God's kingdom? What do you have to do? Let's go to John 3, verse 5, because here is really where we're going to spend the main focus of our lesson, this uh, second sermon here. John chapter 3, verse number 5. We're really going to spend the rest of our time trying to understand this verse. Now, before we read verse 5, let's actually start in verse 1 and read our way down into verse 5. So that way we get a better understanding, a better grasp on what's occurring in verse 5. Let's catch the context here. All right, John chapter 3, start here in verse number 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus saith, saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What's happening? Verse 1 says that a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he comes to him by night. Now why do you think he did that? Well, he don't want folks really to know what he's up to. He don't want folks to obviously to know he's talking to Jesus. Well, why would you care if people knew you're talking to Jesus? This, the verse says, was a man who was a ruler of the Jews. This was a man who was of the sect of the Pharisees. We all know the Pharisees didn't like Jesus, and here's a guy who's a Pharisee wanting to talk to Jesus. If his other Pharisee brothers figured out what he's doing, he could be in trouble for that. So he goes to Jesus by night, and what does he tell Jesus? If you look here in verse number 2, it says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Now, when you think about the Pharisees, we usually think about a group of people who didn't believe who Jesus was. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They didn't believe in Jesus at all. Well, this verse actually says different. This verse actually says, according to Nicodemus, notice Nicodemus doesn't say, Oh, I know you are a teacher sent from God. Nicodemus says, We know. We who? The Pharisees. Folks, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the majority of the Pharisees who rejected Jesus, they knew who He was, y'all. 
They knew full well this was God's Messiah. This was the one sent from God, and yet they still rejected Him. That's bad, y'all. That is really bad when people can get that hard-hearted. But that's the way the Pharisees were. You know, and also, folks, people do the same thing today. Look at us. We know Jesus is the Son of God, and yet look at the things we do to Him. So don't be so hard on the Pharisees and say, I can't believe that they knew He was the Son of God and He was the Messiah, and yet they treated Him that way. We know He's the Messiah, and look at the way some Christians treat Him. So sometimes we do the same thing. But Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And what does Nicodemus want? Well, Nicodemus comes up to Jesus and he says, Look, we know you're a teacher come from God. Because no man can do the miracles that we see you doing and not be from God. We know that. Your miracles are proof to us of that. Look what Jesus says to him in verse 3. Jesus doesn't respond by saying, Oh, Nicodemus, come over here. Let me give you a hug. Let me pat you on the back. And I'm just so glad you recognize this. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus gets straight to the point. Jesus says, look, Nicodemus, if you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. Doesn't that kind of seem out of place? I mean, here's Nicodemus saying, hey, look, we know you're a teacher come from God. And the next thing Jesus does is, hey, Nicodemus, to be in the kingdom, you've got to be born again. Isn't that kind of out of the blue? Well, folks, that's really not out of the blue. Jesus knows what Nicodemus is really here for. If Nicodemus, I mean, think about it. Nicodemus says, Jesus, we know you're a teacher come from God. We know about what you've been teaching. What was Jesus teaching the people? What was his main message? Getting into the kingdom of God. Jesus knew what Nicodemus was there for. Nicodemus is telling Jesus, look, we know you're a teacher come from God. We've heard all these teachings. Jesus knows Nicodemus has heard about the teaching of the kingdom. And Jesus gets straight to the point. Nicodemus, if you want to be in my kingdom, you've got to be born again. What does that mean? What does it mean? That's the question Nicodemus has, because look at verse 4. Nicodemus thinks, what are you talking about, Jesus? Being born again. Does that mean you've got to come out of your mama again, be, be, be born again physically? Is that what you're talking about? How is that even possible? How can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That doesn't make sense. He doesn't understand it. You say, well, how couldn't he understand that? Well, put yourself in the shoes of this man. Imagine that you've never heard this before. First time you're really hearing about this, wouldn't you be confused? I would be. Somebody comes up to me, talks about being born again. I never heard anything like that before in my life. I'd be thinking, what are you talking about? So it's kind of natural to see why he would think that. So in verse 5, verse 5, Jesus clears up what he means about being born again. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus here, he's clarifying what he means by born again. He's not talking about being born again physically. He's not talking about that. He's talking about being born of a spiritual nature here. He's talking about being born of water and of the Spirit. Now, what I want you to catch from verse 5 is the fact that he says, if you don't do this, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Y'all, if Jesus says, if you don't do this, you can't enter the kingdom, we better listen up. Because I want to enter into the kingdom of God. And if there is one thing here that Jesus says that I have to do or else I can't enter into that kingdom, if I care anything about God and His kingdom, it would be wise if I listen up to that. This is what Jesus is saying that we have to do to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born again, born of water and the Spirit. What's that mean? What's that mean? Now, I know what we will usually tell denominational people. We'll say, well, that means baptism. Okay, I agree with that. I think it is baptism. But, folks, can you actually demonstrate that to somebody? Is it really baptism? How do you know that? Well, I just think it's baptism because it mentions water. Just because it mentions water don't mean it's baptism here. Could be something different he's talking about. You ever think about that? How do you show somebody what this really means? Well, first of all, let me show you the simplest way to do it. First of all, when you look at the word water here, really, I, I want to say this to y'all. Folks, we, we can't just harp on the water part of it. Because verse 5 not only says you have to be born of water, it also says you've got to be born of the Spirit. This is one birth 
that has two parts to it, okay? You have to be born, and this is a birth that has two parts, two elements. Born of water and the Spirit. Don't just focus on the water part and ignore the Spirit part. You've got to have both of them. Let's talk about being born of water, though. We're going to get to being born of the Spirit in just a second. Let's talk about being born of water. Obviously, like I've said, most of us recognize, well, that's got to be baptism. Is it? How do you prove that to somebody? All you have to do to show somebody that this is baptism is keep it in the context and show them that here in the very chapter they're reading, here in John chapter 3, that just a few verses down, the Bible actually shows us that it is water. Look and notice in verse number 22. Verse number 22. It says, And after these things, after Jesus got through talking with Nicodemus, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and did what? And he baptized. Now watch it, verse 23. Here's where it gets even better. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Siloam because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now think about it. Put yourself in the shoes of Nicodemus, okay? What's going on at this particular time in history? The hot topic, the main thing that is the talk of the town is what John and Jesus are doing by baptizing people. That's what everybody's talking about. How Jesus and John are baptizing multitudes of people. That's what's going on. Put yourself in that setting. And imagine if Jesus comes up to you and says, be born of water. What do you think he's going to be talking about? What would anybody think? living in that situation, living in that area, in that culture, in that time with all this stuff going on, what would anybody naturally think? You're going to think baptism. You can't help but think that. So in the context of the chapter and in the context of the culture of the time, folks, when Jesus says be born of water and the Spirit, He's obviously talking about being baptized in water. Obviously. Well, if you go back to John 3, 5, he not only says you have to be born of water, but he also says you got to be born of the Spirit. We get the water parts talking about baptism, but what's the Spirit part? What, what's that got to do with anything? What's that? Well, again, some people look at that and they'll say, well, that's where the Holy Spirit gets you. Holy Spirit comes down and gets a holt on you. And they'll come up and ask you, Holy Ghost got you yet? <laughs> what, is that what it means? Holy, Sp Holy Spirit just comes down and grabs you somehow? What's it mean? Let's let the Bible explain it. It's really simple. What this means is that the Holy Spirit teaches you what to do to obey God. How do we know about baptism? Say, well, my mama told me about it. Where'd your mama get it from? She got it from granddaddy. Where'd granddaddy get it from? If you keep tracing it back, you're eventually going to walk it back to the Bible. If it wasn't for the Bible, nobody would know about baptism. None of us would know about it. Baptism is taught to us from the Bible. Where did we get the Bible from? It, oh, I guess it just popped up one day. God gave us the Bible. How did God give you the Bible? God gave you this book that you're holding in your hand by the Holy Spirit. God sent the Holy Spirit to certain select individuals, and the Holy Spirit guided them to write exactly what God wanted them to write. Them jokers didn't sit down and come up what they wanted with what they wanted to. Those people were guided by the hand of God. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit through the Word that you have in your hand is what leads you to obey God in baptism. That's what it means to be born of the Spirit. It means that you listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Now let me demonstrate this to you. Hold your finger here in John 3, 5. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, 26. Actually, let's start in verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The church is those people who have been cleansed. It's the people who have been sanctified. That's what the church is. 
What is the church? It's the saved people of God. Those people God has washed, cleansed, and sanctified. How has God done it? What's verse 26 say? He has done it through the washing of water with the Word. Now, do you catch the parallel between that verse and John 3, 5? John 3, 5 talks about how we have to be born of water and the Spirit, but Ephesians 5, 26 says it's water and the Word. The difference between John 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 26 is John 3, 5 says Spirit, but John, Ephesians 5, 26 says the Word. What that means is it's the Holy Spirit's Word. When you parallel these two verses, you can begin to make sense of John 3, 5 and what it means to be born of the Spirit. It means I receive a new birth because I have obeyed the Word of the Spirit by getting into that water. That's what that means. Now, let me do this really quick because I know we're running out of time and you're thinking, man, we were all night last night singing, you're going to keep us long here too. Well, we're going to hurry up and get done with this really quick. But when you look at it this way, and you pay attention to the Bible, the meaning of John 3, 5, it's pretty obvious, pretty clear. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can give this to your denominational friends. And they say, I don't really think baptism is that important for you being saved. Well, look at John 3, 5. The man who you say is your Lord says, if you don't do this, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How could it not be essential? It is essential. You know, I hear people say, well, you can't show me a verse that says if you're not baptized, you can't be saved. Here it is. John 3, 5 says it. John 3, 5 says if you don't do it, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Bottom line. But what do denominational people do with this verse? What do they do with it? Well, I'll show you some of the things they do with it. Let me show you one argument that they give against this verse meaning baptism. Folks, the denominations who say baptism isn't essential, they cannot allow this verse, cannot allow it to be baptism. Can't. Because if it does mean baptism, it means they're lost. It means the whole denominational community who's telling us baptism isn't essential is wrong. They cannot let this be baptism. So they've got to come up with something against that. So what do they say about it? I'm going to try to explain this because this is really one of the most predominant views of this verse that has really taken a hold of the denominational world. I'm going to try to explain it to you the best that I can. What they'll say is, here in John 3, 5, they'll say the word water. Water is not actually talking about literal water. Not talking about water like we got in the water fountain or water like we have in the baptistry. It's not talking about literal H2O. They will say that water is simply a symbol here. Water is figurative. Water is symbolic here. And what water symbolizes here is just simply the fact that God has to spiritually cleanse you. That's what water means. Water in this verse just simply means a spiritual purification. That's what it's a figure for. It's not talking about baptism. Not talking about literal water. It's just a symbol for spiritual cleansing. Okay. You say, well, where are they getting that from? You know, I'm not going to believe them just because they say that's what it means. Where are they getting that from? Here's where they get that from. If you're here in John chapter 3, drop down and look. Let me check it really quick. Look at about verse 8. John 3, actually verse number 10 rather, I'm sorry. John 3, verses 9 and 10. Let's do that. John 3, verses 9 through 10. After Jesus tells Nicodemus, you have to be born of water and the Spirit, look what happens here. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Nicodemus hears all this, and Nicodemus is thinking, This is what we have to do to be a part of God's kingdom? How can that be? How can it be this way? How is this what God wants us to do? And then look at the response Jesus gives to him in verse number 10. Verse 10, Jesus tells Nicodemus, Nicodemus, 
You're supposed to be a master of Israel. That means a teacher. Nicodemus, you should know this. Because you as a teacher of God's Word, teaching that Old Testament to those Israelites, you should be familiar with this concept of being born again, of being born of water and the Spirit. What does this verse tell me? This verse indicates to me that I can read about being born of water and the Spirit in the Old Testament. What you're reading about in John 3, 5 of being born of water and the Spirit, that's not the first time the Bible has mentioned this. Jesus is talking about it here, but it's been mentioned before in the Old Testament. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you really knew that Old Testament the way you should, you would have already known this. What verses in the Old Testament, y'all, talk about being born of water and the Spirit? You say, that's in the Old Testament? Yeah. Well, I'd like to know where that's at. Let's look at it. Look in Isaiah 44, 3. Hold your finger, John 3, 5. Look in Isaiah 44, 3. Let me show you what denominational people will do. They'll take you to verses like I'm about to show you here, Isaiah 44, verse 3. And they will use this to try to prove to you that water in John 3, 5 is figurative, that it is not literal H2O water and therefore cannot be baptism. Here's what they'll do. Isaiah 44, verse 3. This is God speaking to the Israelites, speaking to the people of Israel. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon, uh, upon thine offspring. God speaking to the people of Israel, and God is promising to bless them. God is promising to give them a spiritual renewal. And what are the terms that God uses to describe this? Did you catch these two words here? God talks about giving, pouring water upon them. And then God talks about what? Pouring out His Spirit upon them. Water and Spirit right here in this verse. All right, here's what denominational people will do. They'll say, all right, reading Isaiah 44.3, is water literal? In that verse, when God says that He was going to pour floods of water upon the Israelites, was that literal? Well, obviously it's not. Did God ever really do that? No. What good would it have done for the Israelites if God poured some water on them? Hey, Israel, I poured some water on you. Thanks, God, we needed that. I really wouldn't do anything to spiritually renew them. Water is a figure here, and that's true. In this verse... Water is figurative, and it is a symbol for spiritual renewal, and that's used all throughout the Old Testament. Let me give you another example. Look in Isaiah, or rather Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Look in verse 25. Here is another example from the Old Testament where God talks about a spiritual rebirth through water and spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36, we're going to read beginning in verse 25. Again, this is God speaking to His people. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be cleansed from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put, watch it, verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Same thing. God's promising to renew His people, to give them this rebirth. And how's God going to do it? He says, I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you. And then later on in verse number 28, or verse number 27, He says He's going to put His spirit in them. The two elements God's going to use to do it. Is water, figure, is water literal in this verse? Well, obviously, water is not literal in this verse. Water is a symbol here. And it even tells you what water symbolizes here. If you go back and look at verse number 25, it says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be cleansed um, from all your filthiness. Water is a symbol of purification from sin. It's not talking about literal water, but it's a symbol here. So here's what denominational people will do. You can kind of see where they're going with this. They'll say, well, 
When Jesus talks about being born of water and the Spirit in John 3, 5, He obviously is referring to these Old Testament texts. And in those Old Testament texts, water was symbolic. So why wouldn't we think water would be symbolic here in John 3, 5 as well? So see, John 3, 5 is not talking about baptism. All Jesus is saying here is you've got to have a spiritual renewal, a spiritual cleansing of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, that makes sense. I can see where they're getting that from. Hard to see how that would necessarily be wrong. Maybe they've got a point. Maybe John 3, 5 isn't talking about baptism. What do you do? Folks, let me show you how to do this. It's real simple. Here's how you answer that argument. To answer the argument is to grant it. Folks, they're right. Water here is symbolic. But that don't mean it's not talking about baptism. It is still talking about baptism. You know how I know that? Ask yourself one question. Let's say John 3, 5, water here just simply means a spiritual purification. All you have to do is ask yourself, well, when does God give us that? At what point does God spiritually cleanse us? I think we all know the answer to that. Baptism. So even if you grant their argument, you grant what they're saying, it still brings you right back around to baptism. Because the Bible tells us in plenty of other places that we are spiritually made pure in the waters of baptism. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. We all know that verse. The Bible says that baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. Baptism gives you a good conscience towards God. It cleanses that conscience. Baptism is a spiritual cleansing. So even if what the denominations are saying about John 3, 5 is true, okay, it's true. Good for you. Pat you on the back. Great job. But guess what? We're still right back at baptism again. And not only that, but go back to John 3, 5. Let me show you even from the context of John 3, 5 that even if you interpret water to mean a spiritual cleansing, it still means baptism. Go back to John chapter 3, verse number 5 again, and let me show you another scripture or another verse in that same chapter that has to do with this. John chapter 3, and I want you to drop down with me now and look at verse 25. John 3, look at verse 25. This is a good one, y'all. I like this verse. Good one. John 3, 25. Does baptism have anything to do with your salvation and making you pure in the eyes of God? I don't think so. Well, let's look at it. John chapter 3, verse number 25. It says, Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Catch it? They got a question now. They're all concerned. And their concern and their question is about purifying. How is a person made pure before God? How does that happen? They got a question about it. What's their question about? Look at the next verse, verse 26. It tells you what their question is. Verse number 26, it says, And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, that's Jesus, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. Put it together. Verse 25, they have a question about how is a person made pure? What is that question specifically? Baptism. They say, now John... We got a question about being purified here. We got another man who's purifying people the way that you are. Jesus is going around baptizing. We thought only you were supposed to be doing that. What does this verse tell you? These people clearly understood that the point at which a person was made pure was in baptism. So again, when you think about the argument the denominations make on John 3, 5, all you have to do to answer it is grant it. Grant their argument, show them that spiritual purification it takes place in baptism, and you got them. You can actually use, really and truly, their argument against them. You can turn it on them and show that even by that train of reasoning, you're still brought back to the same point, baptism. So the reason I'm trying to show you this lesson, folks, is because it's important for us to know, are we in the kingdom of God? Have we truly what Jesus, done what Jesus says we need to do to be in that kingdom? And we need to equip ourselves to show people that, look, this is what Jesus himself says you have to do, or else you cannot be a part of that kingdom. 
So I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to you. And as always, we want to extend the invitation for one here who is not a member of the Lord's Church and for those who may be a part of Christ's Church but in some way or another have strayed away. If you are subject to the invitation in any way, then please come as together we stand and as we sing.